and Sam. Seniors, thanks for letting us take some time to honor you. Uh, glad we were able to do that. Hope Collective, it is good to see you this morning. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Alex. I'm one of the pastors here for Hope Co. Uh, and can we talk a moment about Nat's Coyote? Um, because here's the thing. So we have these geese. We have this problem on our campus, and we try to get rid of the geese, right? So one day, I come into the office, and there's fake swans, plastic swans, out in the pond. And apparently, geese and swans don't like each other. It's kind of like a West Side Story, sharks and jets kind of thing. I don't really understand it, but apparently that's how it goes. But the swans are out there, and the geese don't care. They're, like, swimming right up to the swans, and, like, we're like, yeah, we know. We see right through you, Hope Collective. And the issue is that the swans are fooling the people that we don't want the swans to fool, but they're not fooling the things that we do want them to fool. We've seen people taking pictures of the swans, and I just haven't had the heart to say, like, they're not real. So now everyone knows, and sorry for not saying something sooner. Okay, there we go. So that's just addressing the coyotes. Hey, um want to circle back on something we've been talking about the past couple weeks, uh, but this was the first week that after 10 years of full-time ministry, our lead pastor, Dave Mudd, and his wife, Natalie, who are also, is also a pastor here, they get to take, after 10 years, the sabbatical that our staff members, pastoral staff, get after six years of ministry. So they finally get to take this extended time away to be refreshed and rest and spend time together and with the Lord. And so we are praying for them every single day that they are gone and looking forward to having them come back uh, and join us in August. But that has brought up some questions from some of you, I've got to talk to some of you about what these teaching moments are going to look like over this summer. Uh, so you guys are stuck with me for the next two Sundays. And then on Father's Day, uh, thanks, I think. Um, Father's Day, we get to hear from Professor Jeremy Pettit, who is a former executive pastor here at the Hope Collective, and then we get to start a nine-week series where each Sunday we get to hear from a different member of the Hope Collective family on the fruit of the Spirit. And this idea of spiritual maturity being the character of God being made true of us for the sake of the world. Uh, we got to meet with this group of speakers last Sunday after service and kind of talk about the series and what God uh, was already revealing uh, to people who would be speaking and really excited that we could share those moments together. But just wanted to give everybody a heads up of what that is going to look like. Um, and in the spirit of missing Dave, uh, the spirit of Dave remains because I have seven pages of worth of notes down from nine and we need to get started here pretty quick. So we're going to do that. Uh, Dave, if you're listening, Listening. Love you. Um, so we are in week three of a series on community DNA, where we are talking about community not as the group of people that we're with, not as an environment that we may be in, but community as something we bring into every relationship that we have. And we talk about these four elements of community DNA. Know and be known. Trust that breeds transparency talked about those the past two weeks. This week, we'll be talking about this idea of accountability, and next week, this idea of what does it mean to be spirit-led as a community. And I think of all of the words we use to talk about this community DNA, accountability is probably the word that gets the worst reputation, and the one that makes us feel a little bit squeamish. And so we get to talk about that one this morning, and I don't know what images come to you or what experiences when you hear this word accountability, but they're not always great. And the one uh, experience that comes to me uh, when I think about the word accountability has to do with a guy named Chad. Let me tell you about Chad. It was my uh, freshman year of college, and I did my undergraduate at a uh, very conservative Bible college, and we had a class called Spiritual Life and Community. Yes, it's a class. And so I took this class, and one of the assignments of this class was that you got an assigned accountability partner. This is the stuff that like introverts have nightmares about, right? <laughs> so I had assigned, I'd been assigned an accountability partner. And the project was that you were to meet for 45 minutes to an hour every single week to talk about all of your struggles and temptations that week, confess any sins that you had committed, and pray for one another. And my assigned accountability partner was Chad. You don't need to know anything other about Chad than the fact that I didn't know anything about Chad. And so I'm gonna run this relationship that I had with my assigned accountability partner, Chad, through this grid of community DNA. Ready, you know and be known. I don't know Chad. <laughs> Strike one. Trust that breeds transparency. Because I don't know Chad, I don't trust Chad. Strike two. 
because I neither know nor trust Chad, I don't want him to hold me accountable to absolutely anything. I feel spirit-led right out of this relationship. Thank you very much. I didn't do well in that class. That's another story, but... When we hear the word accountability, there's not always great experiences or connotations that come to mind when we think about this part of community DNA. And there's reasons behind that, but what we need to talk about is the fact that accountability is more than the sum of our most awkward experiences with it. And in fact, if we miss the idea of biblical accountability, which is different than what we would think, if we miss the idea of biblical accountability, we actually miss the purpose of biblical community. And I don't think it's an overstatement to say that. When we miss biblical accountability, we miss the purpose of biblical community. And so what we're going to talk about this morning, we're going to talk about what accountability is. We are going to look to scripture for an example of what it looks like. And then we're going to talk about what has to be true of a community for biblical accountability to take place. That's our roadmap for where we're going to be this morning. So let's talk about this idea of what accountability is. More than our experiences with it. But if we had to give a definition to accountability, accountability is being in a relationship where you know you will be held responsible for and expected to answer for your actions or inaction. That's a general definition of accountability. It's being in a relationship where you know that you will be held responsible to and expected to answer for your actions or inactions. Hence, to give an account for something, accountability. And this idea of accountability is all over our culture right now. There's governmental accountability, we have uh, environmental accountability, social accountability, fiscal accountability has been a really big conversation if you've been following the news the past couple weeks. And we love these forms of accountability. We love accountability for everybody out there, especially people in power, but when we turn the idea of accountability personally, we get a little hesitant. But what we're talking about is really this idea of spiritual accountability. What role does having a group of people in our lives holding us accountable to what God is calling us to do play in our spiritual life together as a community? We talk about this all the time, that we don't believe in a private relationship with Jesus. Every relationship with Jesus is personal, but it is never private. We do this together in a community and we need one another. So what role does this spiritual accountability play in our lives? And we have to say, too, that it's difficult to have this conversation about accountability and about the role of community in our spiritual life without referencing what's become known as the small group ministry movement of the past 40 years in the American church. Our lead pastor, Dave Mudd, shared last week this idea that community does not equal small groups. And for some of us, that made sense. And for some of us, it was a little confusing. But this idea that you can be in community and not be in a small group, this group of six to 12 people that meets once a week for about two hours, but you can also be in a small group and never experience actual biblical community. These two things are different, but our brains connect the two. Why? And it has to do with this idea of the small group ministry movement. And so we're going to take a little bit of time. I'm going to nerd out with you guys, if that's okay, on some social history for the church and where we've been as a society over the past hundred years. Because this idea, what we know as small groups in the church today, they're actually a pretty recent development in church history, really within the past century. And they're part of this larger kind of national trend in American society that's seeking to answer the question of how do we address the breakdown of these traditional relational networks of family and neighborhood and a shared history with a certain group of people that you've known since you've known anything. In kind of the post-World War II era when society became increasingly mobile with airfare and the automobile and the telephone, the place where you grew up was no longer always the place that you settled down. And this relational nest of extended family and grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and neighbors and the people that you grew up with and the people who watched you grow up, all of those things that had defined most of human history up to that point began to disappear as people became more mobile in society. 
And those core relationships where you were known whether you wanted to be or not. And those cultural guardrails of your community that help you figure out what life was supposed to look like for good or for bad. All those kind of went away whenever the better job or the next opportunity or the next thing came along and you uprooted your family from one place to try to transplant into another and had to start all over again in this thing called community. This happened primarily in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but because people still had a need for this shared history and these meaningful, supportive relationships, there were a few pioneers in society at large and in the church specifically who came up with this idea of intentionally bringing together small groups of people between 6 and 12 around something that they had in common even though they came from different places and different walks of life and different perspectives. And doing this created a sense of belonging and community that everybody needed but nobody was having naturally anymore. Some of these groups were hobby or interest-based, really not much more than social clubs, but some of these also had a deeper purpose to them. Dealing with issues like pursuing your goals or becoming a better parent or overcoming addiction or studying God's word. And there's been enough time that's gone by now that there is a name for this thing that happened in American church history called the small group ministry movement, dating back to the 1960s all the way up through the 2000s. And there's research that's been done on the effectiveness of these groups and what makes them work and what doesn't and why they've played such a big role in American life and faith. But the groups that go beyond sort of this social function capacity, something that's more than, hey, I'm new to the area and I need friends. These groups that were about something more than a shared interest but a shared purpose had this distinct element called accountability. And accountability takes a couple different forms. First, these groups in American history, some of them are formed under this idea of positive accountability. And when we say positive accountability, we mean people knowing one another's goals and helping one another pursue them. It's action-oriented. It's directed towards achieving something. It's positive. And the earliest examples of this that we can see in American history, believe it or not, is Weight Watchers. 1961. Jean Nittich is part of this weight loss program and plan that she's a part of, but it's this program that discourages conversation, questions, and discussions. You just have a plan and work the plan, and that's all you need. So what Jean did is she got a group of women together who had a common goal and learned how to celebrate one another, encourage one another, share the stories and the mile markers of that, brought it alongside this plan because she knew and believed that if I wanted to achieve my goals, I need people there to help me get them goes all the way back to the 1960s. We still see examples of this today in online goal-setting groups, gym communities, and peer advisory cohorts for small business owners and entrepreneurs. These positive, let's go after a goal kind of accountability groups. But there's other examples of this as well with negative accountability groups. And we're not saying positive and negative like good and bad but positive as towards achieving a goal, negative as towards avoiding something that you don't want to happen. These negative accountability groups were people knowing one another's struggles and helping one another avoid them. The earliest instance we see of this in American history is Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill Wilson, 1935, a businessman who nearly drank himself into ruin realized that if he was going to overcome his alcoholism, he needed to talk to another alcoholic who understood the struggles and would be there for him if he needed to call him. So he eventually meets a guy named Dr. Rob Smith, and the rest is history. Today, Alcoholics Anonymous exists all over the world. There's this group of people coming together to overcome this particular struggle. Other instances of these kind of groups exist, like Celebrate Recovery, but most notably for us, in our perspective on accountability, the advent of evangelical accountability groups within the Protestant church in the 1990s. So if we're going to double click on this, of these two kind of accountability groups, positive, goal-oriented, and negative sin avoidance, those of us who grew up in Protestant evangelical Christianity have more in our shared history and understanding about these negative accountability groups than we do about the positive ones. During the 1990s, men and women who came of age during the 1960s and the sexual revolution that that entailed began to have kids and teenagers of their own. 
wondering how to help them navigate a society whose norms for morality had changed dramatically. At the same time, the internet was becoming a household staple, giving people easy, instant access to every variety of temptation imaginable. Seeing the need to help people avoid sin and temptation, entire initiatives and ministries and even the purity culture movement came of age during these 1990s and formed around this idea of getting small groups of people together to avoid sin, confess sin, and pray for one another. And these negative, sin-focused accountability groups are the reason that some of us are still following Jesus today because it kept us on the right path. And for others of us in this room, this history of accountability groups with this constant negative focus that became the only focus of the group is the reason that we have so many bad connotations about this idea of accountability. Because it's the group of people I meet with once a week to tell about all the things that I've done wrong, and then we're just going to put that on repeat forever. And the shame and the condemnation that gets associated with that is then what we think about when we hear the word accountability. And let me be clear, is that this idea of having a group of people help you resist temptation and confess sin is critical for our spiritual life because we need those places to be able to share. The research that's come out on accountability groups with this negative focus actually say that they're beneficial for our spiritual life, but not because we have people that we're confessing our sins to on a regular basis. It's having a group of people that you can share anything with and be known and transparent and know that they're not going to leave. It's more about knowing and being known and trust and transparency than it is about having a group of people that you have to report to once a week. Resisting temptation and confessing sin is important, but when that's all that your community is focusing on, you are missing out on so much more of the abundant life that Jesus came to offer us. There's a third kind of accountability, though, that is closest to what we're talking about here, and we're going to call it biblical accountability. So if positive accountability is about what am I trying to achieve and how can you help me, and negative accountability is about what am I trying to avoid and how can you help me, this idea of biblical accountability is people seeking God's will for one another and helping one another live it out. It's people seeking God's will for one another and helping one another live it out. This isn't a self-determined kind of community where I'm coming to this space for you to help me. This is we are coming to this space to listen to God and what he wants and then help one another follow what he's calling us to do. It's not self-directed, it is God-directed. And because God has a will for every single part of our life, these types of communities aren't one-dimensional either. It's not, hey, I'm a small business owner, you're a small business owner, can we help each other achieve our goals in this one area? But we don't really talk about anything else. It's not, hey, I have the struggle with sin and you have the same struggle with sin and we're going to come together to talk about our struggle with sin, but we're not really going to talk about anything else, especially the stuff that's behind and driving all of these addictions. This idea of biblical accountability is a group of people coming together to hear the voice of God for one another and then encourage one another to pursue that. That's this idea of biblical accountability that we're talking about. And the reason that we're talking about all of this history before we even get to a story of biblical accountability in scripture is because this is the water that we've swam in, in our Christian life. And whether we know it or not, the past 100 years of church history has shaped the way that we think about community and shaped the way that we think about accountability. And we mistakenly put this idea of community in this idea of these artificial, self-focused, one-dimensional relationships when God has something for us that is so much deeper and richer than what society has handed us. But when we start to peel back our understanding of community and how the way that we think about accountability may not be the way that God is inviting us to live the Christian life together, It also makes it a little fuzzy and foreign to think about experiences that may have been biblical community in its purest form. Which is why we get to look to scripture to see an instance of biblical community in real time as it played out. And so we've talked about what accountability is, but where do we see a picture of what biblical accountability looks like in the biblical story? 
I'm going to read for us Acts 13, 1 to 3. The verses are going to be on the screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to drop in to a middle of a story in the book of Acts, and then we're going to fill out a little bit more of what's happening on either side of these three verses that we read. This is Acts 13, 1 to 3. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And when we look at this story from Acts 13, I then realize that I put all of my notes out of order. Where are we? Hmm. Yes, okay, let's just go from here. So here's the story that we're talking about. The story so far, when we get to the point of Acts 13, 1 to 3, a few chapters earlier, we've met a guy named Saul, and Saul is a persecutor of the Christian church. He's there at the murder of the first Christian witness, Stephen. And then he goes around the area of Judea, hunting down Christians to have them imprisoned and executed if he can. Saul becomes a threat to the early church, but has this radical experience and encounter with the spirit of Jesus while he's headed to a place called Damascus. Total 180. Saul becomes a follower of Jesus, but it is such a night and day difference that by the time he gets back to Jerusalem and tries to have a conversation with Jesus' followers, the original apostles who are now leaders in the church, they don't believe him. They don't trust him. They think it's a trick. They don't know what's going on anymore. And it takes another man named Barnabas, the Barnabas that we read about in Acts 13, 1 to 3, to come alongside Paul and say, guys, no, listen, this is legit. Something has happened to Saul, and he is actually proclaiming the gospel of Jesus just like you guys are, and we need to receive him into our community. In the background of this, too, is that when Saul became a follower of Jesus, he had a man pray over him named Agabus who had a prophetic word that said, this man, Saul, will be my chosen instrument, says God, to bring the message of Jesus to the Gentiles, not just the Jews. Barnabas advocates for Saul. Saul is received into the community, but then he becomes such an outspoken proclaimer of the good news of Jesus that the religious leaders in Jerusalem put a hit out on him try to kill him. And Saul flees Jerusalem and goes back to his hometown of Tarsus for nine years. Scripture is kind of fuzzy on what Paul was doing during this time. Church historians and traditions say different things. We don't really know what was going on for Saul. But we know that he's in Tarsus, his hometown, probably disowned by his family and his synagogue because he had made this decision to follow Jesus. We fast forward nine years. The persecution of the church in Jerusalem has driven followers of Jesus all over the ancient world. And a few disciples end up in the city called Antioch. Antioch is this melting pot of Jews and non-Jews coming together to figure out how to be a community. The message is preached there and all kinds of people become followers of what was called the way, the way of Jesus. Jews and Gentiles. Now, because there's this big hubbub happening in Antioch, the remaining Jewish leaders in Jerusalem need to send somebody to check it out. So they send Barnabas to Antioch to see if this thing is legit. Barnabas gets there. He sees the Holy Spirit working in and through the Christian community there, made up of Jews and Gentiles, and says, God is doing something incredible here, and I know just the guy who needs to be a part of it. If God's word is going among the Gentiles here in Antioch, I need to go find Saul. Because there's a call on Saul's life to bring the good news to the Gentiles, just like it's happening in Antioch. And so on the off chance that he might find this man who God had spoken of very clearly and had a very clear plan for, before Zoom or phone calls or Facebook or whatever, Barnabas makes the 100-mile trek from Antioch to Tarsus on the off chance that he could find Saul. And he does. He does. 
And just like the fish that grabbed Jonah out of the water and brought him back into his calling, Barnabas goes to Tarsus, gets Saul, and brings him back to Antioch to live out the calling that he has for him, to proclaim the good news of Jesus among the Gentiles. They do fruitful ministry for an entire year, seeing the message of Jesus go forth and the Christian community grow in that place. That's all in Acts 11. And then we get to Acts 13, where we're told that there's another moment of the Holy Spirit speaking and saying, set apart for me these two, Barnabas and Saul, for the task that I have for them. That's all the information they're given. And the early Christian community of the Antioch says, absolutely, God, let's do this. There's a couple things going on here that we need to address, some things that are happening that tell us what kind of community needs to be present in order for us to experience this type of biblical accountability that we're talking about. First, verse 1, we see that the presence of the community in Antioch was grounded in God's word and guided by God's spirit. Two types of people are named in verse 1, prophets and teachers. Prophets listening to what God was saying and how he was going to move the church forward and teachers grounded in what God has already said and the guardrails for how God was going to lead his community. This was a group of people that was shared in their understanding of scripture and God's mission, but fueled by the directing work of the Holy Spirit, and both of these two needing to go together. Second, this community that existed at Antioch was made up of different people from different perspectives. We're introduced to Barnabas once again. We don't know too much about him, except that he's a Jewish man that grew up on the island of Cyprus in the middle of the Mediterranean. Not much more than we know about him, but then we're introduced to Simeon, called Niger. Niger is Latin for black. He's likely a dark-skinned man from Central or South Africa who somehow made his way to the Mediterranean world and was given a Latin name, which means that there's something cross-cultural happening here, that he came from one place, was raised in another, and now is this strange mix of all sorts of different perspectives, but now he's been brought to Antioch where all these different perspectives would exist. Next to Simeon, we're introduced to Lucius of Cyrene in North Africa, another place that's represented, and then Menean. And we're told that Menean was raised in the royal courts with Herod the Tetrarch. This is the same Herod who had John the Baptist beheaded. The same Herod that presided over the mock trial of Jesus before passing him off to Pontius Pilate to be executed. Two boys raised in the royal courts of the highest caste of Jewish society, one participating in the execution of Jesus and one becoming a leader in the early church. Very different and original perspective that Menean got to bring. And then Saul is named, born into one of the intellectual powerhouses of the world at the time at Tarsus in modern-day Turkey, trained in Jewish law under one of the most prominent rabbis of the time. These different men from different places really had only one thing in common, Jesus, and what he was speaking and inviting them to be a part of next. And we can only imagine the perspectives and the conversations that they had as they did meaningful ministry in Antioch over the course of an entire year. Different men from different places were present, and they had, we see this in verse 2, a high degree of shared life. The version that we read from this morning says that while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, but this word that gets translated as worshiping in other places in scripture actually gets translated as the word serving or ministering. It's a word that's used to describe the work of the priests and the Levites in the temple, not just singing in a gathered setting like we would do. It talks about this word is used to refer to public servants performing civil duties without pay. This is the everyday work of ministry that God spoke into the middle of as they served together. For an entire year, these men had served together, prayed together, talked together, made decisions together, probably argued together, forging deep relationships in the fire of whole life ministry. And when God speaks by his Holy Spirit as they are ministering and fasting and says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. They fast, they pray, and then they send these two leaders out with a blessing. But the reason that they're able to do that is because this community didn't exist for itself. 
Saul and Barnabas were some of the most high capacity influential people, not just in the church of Antioch, but in all of early Christianity. The context of Antioch was that ministry was booming. The church was exploding and needed strong leadership to lead it into the future. It would have been very easy for this group of people to say, there was so much meaningful ministry happening here in Antioch. We need Saul and Barnabas to stay not go. But when God said, set these two apart, the entire church community comes together, led by the small group of men, and says, how can we send you out with a blessing? And we're looking forward to hearing the stories of what God does when you come back. This community didn't exist for the community's sake, to preserve itself and its own good. This community existed for God's sake. And when he said go, they said yes. This sending out begins what we now know and refer to as Paul's first missionary journey. First of three or four, depending on how you interpret things. But I love this because we have a story at the end of Acts 14. Saul and Barnabas go on this trip and we actually have the record of when they come back to the sending church in Antioch, this accountability community, and they get to share the stories of what God was able to do through their obedience, not just Saul and Barnabas' obedience, but the obedience of this entire community coming together to discern God's will and help one another pursue that. We actually get to see this story come full circle. This is an example, one of the examples in scripture that shows us what a community of biblical accountability looks like. And I want to draw out four things that we need to have true of our own communities if biblical accountability is going to take place. Four things that we can learn from this particular story. First, biblical accountability requires mission. Biblical accountability requires mission. The purpose of your community cannot be the community itself because the community that exists for itself will eventually end up by itself but a community that is committed to helping one another pursue the will of God will not just grow as individuals and as a community in that depth of relationships, but they will actually be ready to say yes whenever God gives his direction. Second, if biblical accountability requires a mission, it also requires what we're going to call overlap, shared life to bring the different circles of your communities closer and closer together with the same group of people. Because to really know and support one another in pursuing God's will requires having a deep knowledge of someone that goes beyond a hour and a half to two hours once a week if everybody can make it kind of relationship. Because when you've had a meal with someone, when you've served with someone, when you've watched them mess up, when you've watched them ask for forgiveness, when you've had to go to them for forgiveness, when you've seen the way that they treat their kids and your kids and their spouse, when you have seen this person, laughed with them, cried with them, and forged these relationships through shared life, God works in every single one of those moments over time to cultivate a deep sense of belonging and community and accountability, not just between individuals, but in a group of people. There's a Princeton sociologist, his name is Robert Wuthnow, he's done a lot of research and study on the small group movement in America, but he talks about this difference between accountability lines and accountability circles. What's the difference between you knowing a part of me and you knowing a part of me and you knowing a part of me and you knowing a part of me, but none of you knows all of me and none of you know each other? What happens to accountability in that kind of setup? Lines versus circles. He says this, A circle provides for more internal accountability than a series of linear relationships. If your friends don't know each other, you, even without thinking about it, you play up one side of yourself to this friend and a different side to someone else. One friend, for example, can be a confidant on spiritual issues. Another can share babysitting but have no spiritual points of intersection at all. But when your friends all know each other, because they're in the same group, or we could say the same community, you are more likely to experience the tendency towards personal consistency that fellow believers refer to as discipleship. This is a Princeton sociologist. Your friends can compare notes to see if you are treating them all the same. They can decide whether you need advice 
And for them to get all along with each other, they are likely to agree on certain principles themselves. And this agreement will minimize your chances of being pulled in widely different directions. Simple test for overlap in your community and relationships. Do the people who know you also know each other? Because the type of biblical accountability that we're talking about requires a group of people to know all of you, not just parts of you. If biblical accountability requires mission and overlap, it also requires a difference. Because it's hard for us to become more like Jesus when all our friends are just like us. Because where there's no difference, there's no challenge. And we've said this before, where there's no challenge, there's no change. The group of people that God used to help Saul and Barnabas say yes to what he was calling them to do, they looked different, they thought different, they came from different places, and that was where the power came from because they were serving the same God together. Diversity in every form is not just a social issue, it is a spiritual necessity. And biblical accountability requires difference. And finally, biblical accountability requires listening. The first thing that we're told about this community is that there were prophets and teachers present, grounded in God's word, guided by God's spirit, listening to what he has said and listening for what he will say. It's difficult to hold one another accountable to what God is calling us to do if we don't know what God is calling us to do. And how will God trust us with these big moments of revelation if we're not taking the time to listen to those little whispers of instruction in the everyday moments of our lives together? Learning how to listen to God's voice through the Holy Spirit in prayer and scripture and community is essential for this kind of biblical accountability that we're talking about. Not only that, but we need to learn to listen to one another while asking good questions to draw out the deep waters of our hearts like Proverbs 20 verse 5 talks about. And this is where we get to make a plug for next week and what it means to be spirit-led as a community. Because all the things that we're talking about, they're interrelated, right? You're not going to trust yourself to someone if you don't know them. Someone can't hold you accountable to something that they don't know. And all of this is led and united by the Holy Spirit. And so what does it mean for us to listen to the voice of God together as a community and say yes to what he's inviting us to be a part of next? We're going to talk more about that next week. But here's what I would like to leave you with. Something to do today, which is really the flywheel of accountability. If we can get this little thing right and practiced over time, there's so much that God can do if we ask ourselves these two questions and then talk about it with the people in our lives. So I'm gonna leave you with these two questions and the challenge to share your responses with people in your life, your community this week. The first question is this. What is one thing that stood out to you from the message today? Doesn't have to be the main thing. Doesn't have to be the most important thing. But what's something that stood out? Something that maybe you felt curious about or that God just seemed to be drawing your attention to? What is something that stood out to you? And how might God be inviting you to respond? What is God saying? And what are you going to do about it? For us to practice Asking those questions of ourselves is where accountability begins. God, what are you saying and what are you inviting me to do? The good left undone. And then as we share that with other people, to give them the opportunity to be able to encourage us and pray for us as we do that, for us to be able to do that for other people, that is the grounding of biblical accountability that we're talking about here. When we miss accountability... We miss the purpose of biblical community because God has way more in store for us than we have our own strength to pursue. We need each other to say yes to what God has next. What stood out to you? And what do you think God is inviting you to do in response? Would you stand as we dismiss today? I'm gonna pray for us. Holy Spirit, thank you for speaking once through your word and thank you that you speak every single time we open your word, every single time we are together and every single time we turn to you in prayer, you are speaking and so God, I pray that you would open our hearts to listen and thank you for not just giving us your word but for giving us one another.
will you make clear everything that you would have us to do beginning with this next step, this next decision, this next conversation, this next thing? And then would you give us the courage to say yes to your invitation, whether that's of our own accord or the courage that gets poured into us by our community? Will you help us to say yes to what you have in store? We love you, and we're looking forward to hearing the stories of how you lead us this week. Amen. Amen. Love you, Hope Collective. We will see you again next week.